out this morning, it's, it's a bit pretty chilly, isn't it? Especially when you get up here at Norton Tower. And uh, maybe our, our thoughts are turned towards spring, which is a little way off, and summer even further away. Maybe we're thinking about summer holidays. Um, maybe that would be somewhere in the, in the UK or perhaps abroad. I wonder if you've, you've ever been to Greece on your holidays. Um, if you have, you might have stayed in the, in the capital of Athens, which is uh, full of interesting things to see, full of history. Or may you've been to a, a beautiful Greek island, Corfu and Rhodes, Santorini. Thessalonica is a, a less popular holiday destination, but I didn't know this, uh, that it's, uh, although it's about half the population of Athens, it is in fact the second largest city in Greece. That uh, word, that name, that uh, city may sound familiar to you. Well, if it didn't before this morning, um, you might uh, have picked up on the fact that we, we did read just a few minutes ago, I'm sure you were paying attention, from uh, Thessalonians. Uh, Thessalonica is um, then a very uh, well-known place uh, amongst Christians who uh, love to read the New Testament and Paul's letters. And... Uh, well, more than 2,000 years ago, Paul and his co-workers Silas and Timothy went there on what was their second missionary journey. Only in those days it wasn't a, a holiday destination, but it was a, a busy commercial seaport. You might have noticed if you read uh, Paul's journeys, and of course those journeys are detailed for us in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, you'll notice that uh, Paul always had a pattern, he had a practice wherever he went. If there was a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, he always went straight to the synagogue, especially on the Sabbath day where he preached the gospel. And uh, you'll have noticed when we read uh, from the Acts of the Apostles uh, earlier this morning, you'll notice that um, when he spoke there in the synagogue, we are told that some Jews, a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and quite a few prominent women were persuaded by the gospel message that they heard from the lips of Paul. So people were converted, that's great isn't it? Going into a Jewish synagogue and all those various types of people and there were conversions, praise God. But of course as often is the case when God is at work, the great spoiler, Satan is at work too, stirring up trouble and opposition. And so this resulted, we read, don't we, there in the Acts of the Apostles, this resulted in their stay being cut short, reduced to just a few weeks as they were chased out of town. Now, you can imagine, can't you, you put yourself in the, in the shoes of the Apostle Paul and his friends Silas and Berea, and uh, Silas and uh, uh, Paul, Silas and Timothy, and um, you can well imagine that they, they must have been really quite discouraged as they'd, they'd preached and the word had been received by many but now they, they, they were leaving town uh, they must have felt disappointed mission over but not yet mission accomplished and we read there in the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 17 that these young believers fearing for their safety for the safety of Paul and Silas um, under the cover of darkness, they sent them away to nearby Berea, which was actually a distance of something like 50 miles. So the messengers had to leave just as the message was beginning to be received. It would seem that the, 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 the harvest was ripe, but the harvesters had been forced out of town. Their hopes and expectations dashed. Now imagine it for a moment. What about these new believers? And they were all new believers, weren't they? They were just uh, a few weeks old. How, how would they survive, much less thrive, without their evangelist, teacher and shepherd? The work looked to be over almost as soon as it had begun. The prospects, bleak. The planting of a church, unlikely, if not impossible. 
But friends, I have good news for you because this was not, in fact, the case. A church was planted to which Paul would later write two letters. And we have a, one of them here before us in our Bibles. And I invite you this morning, if you have a Bible, to open your Bibles at page 1187. And we're going to begin this morning to think about Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Now this is my, my view, but I reckon that uh, this is one of the most encouraging letters in the New Testament. So if as a Christian you feel in need of encouragement, and which one of us doesn't, then this letter is tailor-made for you. The same goes, of course, for us as a church. After all, this letter was not written to an individual, but it was written to a church. It was written a long time ago, some 2,000 or so years ago. It was written uh, to a different part of the world, uh, to a, a church under different circumstances, a church much younger than ours at 182 years old. And yet, and yet, in many ways, a church much like our own, believing the same gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the saviour of sinners and the head of the church. That is so encouraging, isn't it, to think. Here's a church in, in the New Testament, there are lots of them, Paul wrote uh, 13 letters, most of them to churches. And just to think, here was a church all that time ago, and yet a church which believed the same things that we believed and trusted in the same Lord Jesus Christ that we trust in today. I hope that you find that thought encouraging and exhilarating. So set against the, the background of the, of the sudden forced exit of Paul and his fellow gospel workers from Thessalonica, to read the opening words of this letter is both remarkable and thrilling. This is because here we find that not only have these, well, we could maybe call them babes in Christ, certainly young believers, not only had they survived individually, but they'd actually thrived corporately. And we say that because, well, you've only to read the first chapter as I read it. You, if you want to know um, the calibre of this church, if you want to know where it was uh, in, its, in its beliefs, in its, in its gospel enterprise, in, in, in taking out the gospel into the community far and wide, then just read there the first chapter and on into the other chapters. This was a church. There was a church in Thessalonica, praise God. In just a short time, they had been formed, or they had formed themselves. I, I must put it that way. They would not been formed, but they had formed themselves, these new believers. They had formed themselves into a viable, thriving, functioning, let's say, evangelical church. Let's just read the first two verses. Paul, Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians... In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually remember you in our prayers. Here we find God was at work. We know, of course, that God normally uses means. He used Paul and his co-workers to begin the work in Thessalonica. The gospel was preached, we are told, and a number of people were converted. Now, there's nothing to suggest, as far as we can see, there's nothing to suggest that God employed any extraordinary or what might call supernatural means to gather new converts together, to plant this brand new church where there hadn't been one before. There's nothing to suggest that a nearby church, you know, a church just down the road, another church well established, came alongside them with help and support. We can only speculate, I suppose, perhaps God 
specially gifted some who were still very young in the faith. We might say that he, he, he might have fast-tracked some of them into leadership. But just keep this in mind, keep this in mind, that every single one of them was a new Christian. We might say a babe in Christ. Not one of them had years of Christian experience or experience of what it meant to be a member of a church. We don't know precisely how God did it, but we do know that he did. That God worked amongst them. God was at work. We must remember, mustn't we, that God is sovereign. His hands aren't tied. He can do remarkable things even in situations like this when key gifted workers of the calibre and experience of Paul and his friends are suddenly removed from the scene. And by way of application, this should encourage, shouldn't it? Should encourage all gospel workers, especially those, for example, who are expelled from countries with Islamic or communist or fascist regimes. Of course, they're grieved, deeply concerned. They're left wondering, how will they fare without us? Especially when the Christians are young and the churches are newly planted. But there are examples. We could look into church history. There are examples in church history where, for years, missionary work has been impossible. Missionaries have been banished from the country. But somehow, over time, news has leaked out or circumstances have changed so that they could return, only to discover that to their amazement and joy, that in their absence... Individual Christians and churches haven't just survived, but in some cases, actually thrived. I wonder, do you sometimes fear for the future of the gospel and the survival of the church in our own country as you see so much indifference and increase in hostility? Or in many parts of the world, if you get things, say, from open doors or other bodies working in other parts of the world where Christians suffer persecution, where there is destruction of their homes and their church buildings, where there is brutal treatment, imprisonment and, and martyrdom. We might think, where is the future for the church? Where is the future for the gospel? It's right for us to be concerned. It's right for us to be prayerful. But we must always remember amidst all that, that God is sovereign. He is at work. His purposes, of course, can be resisted. They can be opposed, but ultimately they cannot be thwarted. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 16, verse 18, where he says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So be encouraged by these words to know that the great saviour of the church and the head of the church the Lord Jesus Christ will come what may by one means or another build his church and I would say to you this morning friends that this young church at Thessalonica is proof of this Paul was at a distance from this church the church that he loved you know we're so used these days aren't we to to phones to to social media to Zoom, especially during the pandemic. So used to these things. No such things in those days. They weren't just a, a couple of hours away by car. Communication was slow. News and information carried mainly by word of mouth or letter. It was scarce, it was infrequent. But did this mean that Paul could forget about them? Simply, as we say, move on. Move on with new gospel work in a new location in Berea and then on to Athens. Of course, we know for sure that he did get on with the gospel work wherever God's providence had taken him. He did make use of every opportunity. But forget the Thessalonians or any other Christian converts in many of the places that he preached the gospel on his missionary journeys, never, never, it is unthinkable that Paul would forget them. So the first thing to say is that 
even with the absence of Paul and his co-workers, God was at work. God is at work. Let's never forget that. But secondly, they were not forgotten. They were not forgotten. We know this because those who first brought the gospel to them in Thessalonica wrote them two letters, the first of which we have opened before us this morning. And it's testimony, isn't it, to the, to the humility of Paul. Paul wrote this letter, of course, but it's testimony to his humility that although it, it was his letter written under the inspiration or the direction of the Holy Spirit, he wanted to acknowledge that he wasn't doing his gospel work alone, but in fellowship and supported by his friends, his co-workers, Silas and Paul. And so that's why he includes them in his opening greeting. If we want to know something of where this church was doctrinally, what it believed, whether it was, we might say, a proper church, we'll find out as we go along. But for now, we need go no further than the opening words where Paul writes, Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have noticed when we read that first chapter that later in this opening chapter the Holy Spirit is mentioned twice. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the triune God. And the opening words, the opening verses speak of the equality of the Father and of the Son. The church was in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks, doesn't he, in John chapter 15 of believers being like being in him as branches are in the vine. And Paul writes that believers are like limbs in a body in 1 Corinthians 12. Another time, he says, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Both the Christian and the church are in God the Father and the Son equally. Because Father and Son, though distinct, are one. And this should encourage us, shouldn't it? As it must have encouraged these young Christians to know that they were doubly safe and secure in their faith, which was in both Father and Son. And Paul greets the Thessalonian church with his usual warm and sincere opening greeting. Grace and peace to you. Grace. We love that word, don't we? It's even in our church name. God's free, unmerited, undeserved favour and kindness. If you're a Christian here this morning, it's because God has been gracious to you. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God. So both grace and Grace and peace. This is a, a peace which comes to us when having repented of our sins and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're completely forgiven, reconciled to God. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be at peace with God, to be forgiven. It also has an impact on our relationships with others, both Christians and non-Christians. Paul loved the church. He loved this church. He loved this church that he'd been torn away from so prematurely. How could he show his love for them? He was at a distance. Well, he could do at least two things. One is that he could write them a letter. In fact, he, he writes them two letters. They are amongst the earliest, we believe, that were written in the New Testament, possibly after Galatians. One of them we have open before us. And from the outset, not only does he and his friends send them their warm greetings in this letter, beginning with the words, grace and peace to you, they also express gratitude to God for them and assure them of their prayers. Verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. These new believers, this young church, though it was out of sight, away from the personal involvement and influence of Paul and his friends. It was absolutely not out of their minds and out of their prayers. 
And let me say this, this was a blessed church. This was a blessed church. God was at work in this church and she was being prayed for. Blessed is that church that is prayed for. When someone says to us, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for your church, that church is blessed. Let's just unpack those words for a few moments. Paul, no doubt, prayed for them by himself. I'm sure that when Paul was having what we sometimes term his quiet time, in the, the quietness of the morning hour, the evening, or wherever, whenever it was, and he was there on his own and he was praying, praying for Christians that he, that he knew, and praying for churches, that the Thessalonians would be in his mind. So he no doubt prayed for them by himself personally. But the suggestion here is this, this is more a reference to a prayer meeting because, well, it consisted certainly of at least three, himself and his fellow workers, Silas and Timothy. We know this because he uses not the singular I, but the plural we. Notice that this, this praying it wasn't periodically. Periodic, it, was, it wasn't now and again. He says, we always thank God for all of you. We see that it was persistent praying. We always thank God for all of you and continually, continually remember you in our prayers. I don't know about you, it's easy, isn't it? We say, well, we pray for them and we pray for them for a while and then they just drop out of our minds or off the list. But no, as far as Paul and his friends are concerned, it's continually, continually, again and again and again, praying for these believers. We notice also that it wasn't partial praying, but it was all inclusive. No one was left out. So far as they, they knew of the believers there, so far as they, they knew their names, Paul says, we always thank God for all of you. So he thought of this church. We thank God for all of you and continually remember you in our prayers. I wonder if they had a written list. Do you have a list? Do you have a list where you, you write people's names down? Or you write the names of churches? You write of missionary situations in another part of the world? You write them down and, and you look at them and you, and you pray for them. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe Paul had a, had a list. Or maybe as he prayed, their, their faces appeared in their mind's eye. Do you find that when you pray for someone? When you pray for somebody maybe in the church... Uh, and you, you mention it by name and, and there's a little picture in your mind and you think, ah, there she is, there he is. And we remember to pray for them in their particular situation and circumstances. Of course, we know, don't we, that Paul, the Apostle Paul, placed great emphasis upon prayer. He asked others to pray for him. You know, Paul, we, we refer to him, don't we, as the great Apostle Paul. I'm sure he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have liked that, but that's, he was, under God, a great, a great man, a great Apostle. But uh, he asked others to pray for him. He says in Ephesians 6, verse 19, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I, may, I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the Gospel. Pray for me, says Paul. Please pray for me. He asked others to pray for him and his fellow workers. Colossians chapter 4. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Pray. Prayer was so important to the Apostle Paul. He wanted the prayers of the people. And you'll probably know that, I guess it's, along with a number of other verses in the Bible, the shortest, amongst the shortest verses in the Bible, in this very letter, in chapter 5, verse 17, where Paul says, pray continually. Another version says, pray without ceasing. Pray continually. Keep on praying. Jesus said, didn't he? Um, ask and it will be given unto you. Knock and, knock and the door will be opened to you. Seek and you will find. Keep on, keep on, keep on. And again in chapter 5 and verse 
25 of this very letter, Paul again says, brothers and sisters, pray for us. You might think, well, this church needed Paul to pray for them. Of course it did. But pray for us. Pray for me, says Paul. Pray for my fellow workers. Pray, pray. When you think about Paul, what do you, what do you think? Well, I guess you would think of him as an evangelist. Uh, evangelist, a missionary, church planter, pastor. He, he talks about having a concern for all the churches. But that which was, was foundational to all his ministries was that he was a man of prayer. Whatever else Paul was, he was a man of prayer. Whatever else we are, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you've been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, first and foremost, you are to be a man, a woman, a young person of prayer. Be a man of prayer. Be a woman of prayer. Be a boy of prayer. Be a girl of prayer. And this is something, isn't it, that we, we, we must take this responsibility and privilege seriously it's true isn't it we can't we we say don't we well you know i can't be in more than one place at once but our prayers can you thought about that before you came out this morning maybe you prayed for someone at the other side of the world or someone just down the road or someone here this morning you prayed for them and although we can't be in more than one place at once, our prayers can. We can't be personally involved in gospel work and church life all over the country, much less all over the world, but we can be involved in lots of it through our prayers. Do you pray for others? Do you pray for others in the church? Do you pray that others that come here on a Sunday morning or afternoon who are not saved, do you pray for them? Do you pray for churches in other places, down the road or in the next town? Do you pray for the persecuted church? Do you pray for the work of the gospel across the world? This is, this is our responsibility and privilege, isn't it, to pray. Like Paul and his friends, let's remember one another in prayer, both in the local church and beyond it, beyond it far and wide, world wide and let us pray as a church if Paul here if he stresses how that he was praying for them let us pray as a church and what better place to do that than at a church prayer meeting once again let me commend that to you to come together it's something special isn't it where, where the Lord's people come together to pray make every effort change habits, self-sacrifice, whatever it takes, get to the prayer meeting and pray with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we be able to say with the Apostle Paul and his fellow workers, we always thank God for you and continually, continually remember you in our prayers. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving to us this very precious and encouraging letter in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. We thank you, Lord, that it's been preserved for us so that we might, we might read, we might be encouraged, we might be corrected, we might see here, Lord, a, a, a wonderful example of a, of a thriving church, a thriving new young church. And to be reminded also this morning, although the Apostle Paul and his friends were many miles away from this church, they did not forget to pray for her and for its individual members. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be increasingly a praying church, we would be praying Christians, we would pray on our own, we would pray together, we would come together and raise our voices, Lord, and beseech you to bless the preaching of the Gospel even today, Lord, that you will save people. You will bring people out of darkness into your marvellous light. In this town, in this place, in this room, in this country and across the world, that there will be those who will be brought to a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
there will be those, Lord, who will come to know what it is to be forgiven and at peace with God. Graciously hear as we pray, as we come in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.